participants and voices. Now, in this next session, we'll be looking at uh, what happens when the net is not your friend. So we'll be looking at a few of those um, dangers, challenges, and issues that all people who are actively political online um, should be considering when they're using the net for their political actions. Now, um, here in Germany, this is also an issue. We have issues around data protection, data retention, state trojans, all these things that are um, undermining or affecting our civil, civil liberties and could become very, very serious when you're politically active. But in this next session, we also want to take a look outside of Germany and Europe and see how this situation affects on people when there is a lack of rule of law and a lack of civil rights, and also think about what Germany and Europe's role is in protecting and defending those rights online and offline. So that's my little pitch for the next session. I have four fabulous panelists that I'd like to welcome on stage now. So please come up and join me, um, Reem Almazri, Maya and Dira Ganesh, Christian Mir, and Jeremy Zimmerman. Maybe you can take the outside ones, and then I can take the gentleman tighter control. OK, so let me introduce my four panelists to you very quickly. Riam Amazri is um, from Jordan. Um, she is a studied in communication, culture, and technology, and has been involved in different um, programs and actions um, to basically strengthen the rights of underrepresented communities and local communities through different media, especially in her work with a radio station. So um, in the past, a major area of her work has been activating the role of citizen media, especially to hold the government accountable for their actions. And she'll be sharing some of the insights of what she's been doing on that. Please welcome Reem. On the other side of the table, I'd like you to welcome Maya and Dira Ganesh. Maya has been active um, with a number of different nonprofit organizations, including UNICEF, the Tata Institute for Social Sciences in Mumbai, just to name two of a long list of organizations she's been active with. She's also been active on a lot of different topics and areas, all of which fit very well into our conference, including the topic of violence against women, sexuality rights, HIV AIDS prevention, and working with young people and digital media in the making sure that they know about and can protect their communication rights. Uh, Maya is also here today working for representing the organization Tactical Technology Collective, which is um, an organization with different global bases around the world that works with activists and gives different uh, tools and trainings to strengthen them in their work. And you'll be sharing some of Tactical tax work. Welcome, Maya. To my right, I have Christian Mir, who is a journalist and human rights professional and also a media expert. Christian has a lot of experience working with activists and journalists and protecting their rights, um, previously with the organization NOST and now in his new role since April of 2012 as executive director of Reporters Without Borders here in Germany. Welcome, Christian. And last but not least, to my left, I'd like you to welcome Jeremy Zimmerman. Jeremy is a hacker and a spokesperson and also the co-founder of an organization called La Quadrature du Net, which is a French advocacy group for defending citizens' rights online. Um, Jeremy has worked a lot in a different different technology groups on the topics of freedom of expression, copyright, regulation of telecommunications, and online privacy. So he's an absolute expert on all these topics. Welcome, Jeremy. So we left off the last discussion with a point on political action in commercial spheres. And Jeremy, uh, I, I'm right. You don't have a Facebook account, is that correct? Yes, you're, you're correct. Can you hear me? Yeah. I, why don't you have one? Um, oh, so this is a question, right? Yeah. yeah I, I, <laughs> I, I actually, I'm, I'm not sure what, I, what I'm doing on this panel because, uh, well, I, I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't have a Facebook account because architecture matters. And when we speak about architecture, we're speaking here of centralized services in the hand of one 
economic actor based in the US where a national security agency has open bar access to every data stored in the country. So the, the architectural pattern of everybody handing away data to Facebook uh, is matched by those uh, political and technological uh, facts related to, to, to architecture. And so if you, if you ask me about, um, if you ask me through this question, uh, I don't know whether, uh, why I don't use Facebook for my activism or why I don't use Facebook for protecting my privacy or why I don't use Facebook to protect myself against some evil government service uh, would be a very much different question and a very much different answer to give you. So. Can you specify the question? I will specify. <laughs> what, what do you think when people use Facebook as a place to uh, yes, basically express their political views and create political action? I, I, I'm afraid I cannot answer this in reasonable and universal terms. You no, can answer can, very personally if you like. I, I can, yeah, I can tell you about myself, but come on, I'm a rich kid in the Western world whose knees have never been broken to get passwords. So wh when we're uh, speaking about uh, uh, surveillance, uh, control, and censorship, uh, first of all, it's very different uh, depending on where you're based in this world. Uh, then we are not speaking of one tool or one company, such as Facebook. We are, we are speaking of very broad and generic concepts that you have to, 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 to comprehend and work on as a kind of hygiene. So you, you could speak about the, the technological aspect, and so this is me rephrasing your question, I'm sorry. I'm doing uh, a bad job. So right? you, 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 we could rephrase this is in the, the technological aspects of control and surveillance, and there, there, are, uh, uh, there are a few things to say. F first of all, it's, uh, we're talking about security, so we are talking about risk analysis. Who targets you and for what and with what means? And I encourage everyone to watch this uh, conference at the 29C3 by those whistleblowers from the NSA. And in the end, when Jake Applebaum asks, um, I think he asks Thomas Drake, is there one protocol, one encryption, one algorithm that we can trust? The answer of Thomas Drake is, well, when you're targeted, you're targeted. So, in the end, there is no technological tool that can save us from surveillance and control. But of course, there are good practices that are related to, to, to architecture and, um, and to the, the, the human nature of security. Um, when, you, when you speak of computer security, you can, you can safely say, uh, use decentralized services, use end-to-end -end encryption, so nobody else than your recipient and yourself, in theory, uh, has the ability to read the message, and in a more broader sense, use free software, so you don't hand out the key to your uh, private life to some very cool and shiny company, whether it's Apple or Microsoft or whoever else. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if this is a much broader uh, answer uh, to, to your question. But no, I was kind of hoping you would you would do that and take that route. Um, and I think uh, it would be good because I think there are a lot of people in the room who have a lot of knowledge on the key points that you've just given, so decentral technologies and encryption tools. But I also think there are a lot of people who have maybe not had practical experience using those kind of things. So maybe you can also give some very just concrete examples of tools that you recommend for people to use in s different situations. Once again, you, you put me in a, in a very tough situation because just imagine, I say, oh, you could use Pidgin and OTR to encrypt your uh, chat communication. And somewhere in the room uses Pidgin and OTR and there's a security hole in this and his government is particularly violent and go through these security holes and find what he's talking about and kills him. You know, wh what responsibility would I have if I was just recommending tools? So it's not about tools. You cannot trust the tools. You have to always uh, question the tools themselves. And it's like hygiene. You know, you cannot take a shower once and then consider you're clean forever. You have to, to wash yourself uh, regularly. So um, you, you can recommend... Uh, yeah. Ah, okay. you, you, you can recommend <laughs> concepts. You can recommend practices. But all of them require, and I think this is the, the crux of all, all I'm doing, all of this requires uh, an understanding of technology. 
you cannot rely on a black box to protect your fundamental freedoms. You cannot rely on Facebook, on Apple, on Google to protect your fundamental freedoms or to protect your physical safety if you're in danger because of your opinion or because of your activism. So we can recommend concepts, but then putting those concepts into practice uh, will be made in accordance with your very own risk analysis, who targets you for what, and also what you, you, you're ready to, to deploy as, as resources. So if in doubt, the, 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 well, there is one, actually there is one universal answer to that question. Uh, if in doubt, don't use any tool. Don't even use a computer. Don't even use the internet. And um, to, to, when, when uh, Thomas Drake answered, when you're targeted, you're targeted, actually Bill Biney, which is the, the, with the, the, the other whistleblower from the NSA who worked there for 40 years and who, who designed the, the surveillance uh, mechanisms at NSA, was in charge of the world section of NSA. Can you, can you imagine that? Uh, answered with a, a very clever answer. And he said, I always preferred code to ciphers. Cipher is the... the the, the um, uh, encryption mechanism, and the code is something human. If I call Fukami and say, let's go for a walk, but it means let's meet in this bar uh, in Kreuzberg, then a machine cannot process that and know that let's go for a walk means let's go to this bar in Kreuzberg that we agreed on previously. When I say let's go for a walk at 17, we, we both know that it means let's go for a walk at 15. And once again, somebody who wasn't here when you discussed that before that phone call will not know it. And that was the answer of, of um, Bill Biney. And this is precisely what it's, he says, is because to break codes, you need humans, and we don't have humans. So I think we, we are speaking about practices here, and I don't want to m monopolize the, the speaking time, and I'll, I'll get back to other aspects of it later. Okay, thanks. That's fine. I'll make sure it's evenly distributed, but I think that was a very, very central point, so I wanted you to raise that in the beginning, and I'm glad you did, that um, all too often it's, uh, you know, we use different technologies and different tools that seem very empowering, but don't think about the consequences of them, and um, I think the one other word I'd like to add to what you said is context. It always matters so much on the context that you're in, both politically and technologically. Um, for instance, if you're living somewhere in Ethiopia, say, and you have a monopolistic telecommunications with structure with just one provider, then using something like Tor can be dangerous if you know your government is doing package inspections and will probably notice you're the one person connected to the internet using that technology and will wonder why. So um, having said that and announced that we're moving outside of the European context too, I would like to pass the word to Reem. You work um, watching what your government does with different activists and journalists and maybe you can just start by giving us a little bit of an introduction to the situation in Jordan, because I'm sure not everybody in the room is familiar with that. Okay. Um, I'm, ever since uh, 2000, I want to apologize for my voice first. I hope it's not uh, that bad on an amplifier <laughs> too. Uh, but uh, ever since uh, the waves of uh, revolutions started in the Middle East, uh, governments that has not got um, the wind of the revolution, let's say, started thinking a bit more smartly on how to react uh, to the internet being a facilitator and bringing people together and raising oppositional voices. So in a country like Jordan, where people started raising their voices in 2011, um, because that was uh, the environment all over the region, um, the government started thinking more about controlling these voices, but in a way that is smart and would not cause a major opposition and a major reaction that will also uh, amplify uh, the, the effect that has happened in the region. Uh, so to do that, um, uh, we have recently, uh, the Jordanian government have recently passed a media and publication law in a very smart way, I'd call it, uh, because uh, it uh, all of a sudden, in uh, November 2012, we hear about um, a group that is calling for uh, porn censorship in Jordan. And we've never actually heard of this group, and they, were, they did not have a history in activism or uh, in, in raising this concern. And because we are a very conservative uh, society, this actually appealed to many people in Jordan. And 
all of a sudden, there is also this talk in the parliament about a media law that will uh, have uh, websites uh, register any electronic website without even, um, uh, not news websites, we have 400 news websites. And this was made to actually constrain these uh, websites. However, the definition in the law was any electronic websites um, um, that publish anything regarding uh, Jordan's social or political affairs. So these two campaigns uh, started uh, overlapping each other as uh, just an, in, in a deliberate way that will confuse people. So people would actually, m most people, they were for um, the censorship of, um, of uh, porn and adult websites because uh, they thought that uh, it's really affecting their kids. And uh, they, they, it actually made sense for the government to have a bit more control on what we can see online. Uh, even and, and they did not really uh, care a lot about uh, the the people that are directly affected by this, which is the news websites. So it was an easy battle actually, and and the law got passed because all the protests that we've done uh, was only mainly for people whose whose lives and work were directly affected by the censorship of the internet, rather than um, uh, just regular internet users who. Um, think that you know they'll still do the same things that they've done with or without uh, uh, the censorship that is coming. Uh, Jordan does not have uh, a history in censorship, and the cases that we've had are actually very few. So we still don't know how this law is going to be used. We're very unpredictable. So uh, uh, some people, some of us think that uh, this law will be used only case by case because uh, these uh, 400 uh, electronic websites were um, uh, very much um, uncontrolled in the way that they spread they, they spread or or report about government corrupted cases. Um, there is an agreement that. It needs some kind of regulation um, because uh, they've been acting a bit uh, in a very uncredible way. Uh, but at the same time, um, we don't know if this law will actually uh, be uh, uh, the legal background for uh, a white space, a white scale uh, censorship activity on these websites. It's also um, uh, this law also included um, pages like Facebook. Uh, like YouTube, not not explicitly, but implicitly by defining that any any website should re any register uh, or any website that should uh, register is a website that publishes uh, news on Jordan. So I can be somebody who did uh, a YouTube video, for example, on uh, something that happened around me and published it on YouTube. So that will also qualify me under this uh, kind of uh, uh, of law. Um, so that's that's about uh, uh, the background, and uh, it's it, the, the talk about uh, censorship has not been an issue until actually recently, and uh, I feel that uh, um, a lot of governments are are learning from that, and having a legal framework for censorship or not in the region uh, does not actually mean that this will reflect how the government will act, because. Most of the countries in the region do not act upon law. We're not uh, places, and, and this is where I think where the different comes the difference comes between talking about uh, uh, online activism or mobilizing and and, and being more political uh, in in parliaments uh, in in, in uh, Germany or in Europe than in the Middle East, because we don't have the rule of law on law in Jordan. It's either you have or or a lot of countries around the world. I mean, around the region, it's either you have. Um, uh, some kind of uh, censorship mentality, or you don't. And if you have censorship mentality in the government, it doesn't mean that you can talk against it. Because, first of all, governments are not representatives of the people, given the uh, electoral law. So it's really hard to mobilize in, in uh, these parliaments. And mainly, uh, parliaments are just a tool for governments, and at least in Jordan. Uh, and. I, I was in a conference about internet governance in Tunis where a lot of uh, participants were from different countries. And uh, you can see that although uh, some uh, countries where revolutions uh, happened, like in Tunis and in Egypt, 
th th there was a, uh, more freedom to uh, talk online and, the sen and all the censorship were gone after the revolutions. However, you can see, still see cases where uh, bloggers and rappers, for example, in Tunis got uh, arrested uh, uh, because they published a YouTube video on um, um, criticizing the police and saying that police are dogs. So they were taken, although it's after the revolution, all censorship equipment were gone and uh, also, and the, the institute that was responsible for that uh, stopped playing that role, but they were still taken. Uh, and so I don't want to take much of other people's time. So that's, that's fine. I'm, like I said, I'm going to give everybody a little bit of a longer speaking slot in the beginning. Just one quick question on that. What kind of strategy, like with that kind of environment that you're working in, and you said that there's a, you know, l restraints and l limitations, and you cannot expect the government to protect your rights. What, what are the strategies that you have to um, organize against that? Okay, I just want to give one example where one law was uh, repeated which was uh, the demonstration law. In uh, Jordan, before 2011, there was a law that uh, prohibited any group, more than 10 people, to demonstrate without uh, a permit from the government. However, after the revolution started, and even before, uh, I mean, it was not practiced, it, but if the government wanted to use it against the people demonstrating, it, it could have. Uh, but after the revolution, well, people are just started going to the streets and uh, they didn't really care about the law and they were, because it was immoral, it was an immoral law and people thought that they should do the moral thing of actually going to the streets and protest. And eventually this law was repeated by, um, um, by, by, by a parliament that was, let's say, that had somehow uh, a good percentage of people that believed in freedom and civil rights. Um, and uh, this is this is one thing. So, for us, and it's it's about actually doing what we believe in, even that we know that uh, the loss is actually bigger uh, than, the, and and we know that there is no rule of law. And then for the second thing is that as 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 we've referred to in the in the past uh, panel, that you need to be a bit more proactive and uh, and uh, uh, maybe raise awareness on. Um, on civil rights and freedom of speech and especially digital rights as well when it comes to internet governance too. Uh, so we've started uh, um, a research on internet governance that uh, will actually bring down the concepts, the technical concepts of how the internet works uh, to the user's level through different creative media. Uh, we also uh, working with lawyers uh, and uh, documenting different cases of censorship, even though that there's still few now because the law was only passed uh, last year. Um, but uh, we're trying to build capacity in that sense. Thanks. Um, of course, we don't want to get too deep into the internet governance discussion, but India is, of course, one of the countries that's a big player in that current discussion on the future of internet governance, uh, with a current push of several countries towards a more uh, governmental, stronger governmental role in internet governance in general, equaling in stronger capabilities of governments to control the internet in their national spheres as well. Um, maybe analog to how um, Reem just presented the situation in Jordan, um, you can tell us and share a little bit. You know, of course, India is perceived also um, as a high spot of technological development. Um, so how that fits together with also a very value-based and restrictive society. Sure. Thank you. Um, OK, I'm going to tell you. Um, three stories really quickly because I believe that stories um, are things that we remember. Uh, a few months ago, there was a um, very popular, extremely violent, virulent right-wing Hindu leader who died. And um, when he died, um, and his, his stronghold was the city of Bombay, which is the heart of commerce and Bollywood and all that. Um, when he died, there was, of course, you know, it was very tense because people expected sort of riots, tension in the streets and things. Um, and sure enough, there were, you know, traffic blocks and things. Uh, there was a young woman who posted a comment on Facebook saying, um, this, this man, when he was alive, he did all of these things. And even in his death, he's, you know, such a pain uh, in the you know where. And um, somebody else liked that comment on Facebook. And... Um, Within about 12 hours, they were called to the local police station and they were detained, okay? 
that's one story. Um, the other was is of um, um, a very wealthy industrialist. I want to say he's an industrialist, except he also produces Bollywood films. He's a guy, let's just say, with lots and lots of money. Um, he's one of the few people who can still take out half-page ads in newspapers, which are extremely expensive things to do in India. Um, he has this um, business school, or business school, should I say, and uh, about a year and a half ago, a very critical, interesting political magazine did an expose on this, this fake MBA school that he has. And um, at that time, he filed cases against the journalists and the, the news magazines. What started happening was this, um, this article started popping up across the internet, and people started raising the issue again. Some bloggers started talking about it. Um, all that he did was um, file defamation cases against these bloggers, and the government, without asking, just you know, said this has to be, this content has to be taken down. Interestingly, this has sort of led to a sort of Streisand effect where all kinds of average people have just started posting that very critical article all over the internet again. Um, so that's, that's another story. And I think that, uh, and the third story I'll tell is about, again, about a year or so ago, there was a very popular, um, very catchy song from a Tamil film. So not Bollywood, but another kind of regional cinema. And um, there was this spate of, you know, blocks of music sharing, file sharing websites, and nobody could understand, you know, where was this coming from? Why are ISPs just kind of, you know, rolling over and saying yes and, you know, blocking, um, blocking these sites? It turns out that the producers of the film that the song is featured in um, just kind of, you know, went to court and said, uh, we don't want people to listen to the song outside of the movie theater. And we don't want people to share it. And so we want to block every single website that's sharing it. And, and to those of us who are kind of part of this community that I think understands the internet, and I say, and I make that distinction because I think we have business and governments that don't actually understand the medium, for one. So the point is you're going to make a song popular by actually having it shared. You know, people are actually going to make money off it as well. Uh, so, and so you have this uh, situation of absurdity where you have a government that, comp that actually at one point wanted to do this thing called pre-screening, uh, which activists made fun of, uh, you know, and there were some great uh, Tumblr memes around it. They wanted to screen content before it went onto the internet. And, <laughs> you know, you were just like, oh my God, what does this even mean? And what's interesting, I think, for me in kind of look, uh, telling these stories um, is that we have to look at it in a certain context. There's a history of censorship where from the 1940s since independence, content has been censored, whether it's um, in cinema, we have a ban on showing kissing, um, whether it's uh, song lyrics, books, film posters, um, theater, all kinds of things are being censored and the government does this um, because there's this notion that people are not citizens, but they're the masses and they must be protected from God knows what, or some arbitrary notion of Indian culture, which the government thinks that it owns and controls, that these things must be protected. And so the, the censorship of the internet, in my view, is actually part of a long standing um, and not so illustrious uh, history of censorship itself. So I think um, that's, that's kind of the. I mean, when you say governmental control, then I'm like, we're in a situation where the government it doesn't even understand the medium, and then is doing something really excessive. We also have this law in place, Section 66A of the IT Act, and there's a lot of people right now trying to mobilize against it um, because it is being misused. And there was a meeting um, in Toronto a few days ago, it's still on, I think, uh, Citizen Lab, and a friend of mine who's there was telling me the story of how somebody at, um, I think Ron Debert, who had Citizen Lab, read out Section 66A of the Indian Information Technology Act, and people in the room were laughing because it has things like, you know, if there is content that hurts feelings, that, you know, if you, if you don't <laughs> like my dog, if you, you know, and just when people thought he had finished, he kept on. It's just that the, the litany of, you know, the, the ways in which you can go wrong in offending people. So there is a recognition that there's something wrong with the law. However, the government is um, extremely, um, you know, incapable, I think of actually knowing how to address it and how to deal with it. There's also few spaces for public engagement. And I'll just end by saying that I don't think all is lost, but I think the voices um, are few and concentrated. So there are things that everyday people are doing on Twitter and 
on Facebook and um, where there's fake news websites, there's, uh, you know, spoofing, there's this, uh, you know, culture, I think, of trying to expose the ridiculousness of what the state is doing and kind of discrediting the state. However, these voices are uh, people who are internet enabled, mostly English speaking, though even that's kind of blurry. I wouldn't say it's only uh, the in English speaking uh, middle class, or upper middle class. Um, so I think there are opportunities there, but there's a lack of, maybe it's critical mass. And in a country like India, you can't play the numbers game when you have 1.2 billion people. So you just have to sort of play with what you have. Um, and I think that a tactical tech, I mean, where this kind of makes sense in the context of our larger work, and going back to Jeremy's point about the platforms we use, um, I think what's important is to look at how you can use these spaces like social media, but at the same time having to raise awareness about what does it mean to actually occupy these spaces. And I feel that's something that in the Indian context is not happening enough. Um, that what does it mean to actually uh, inhabit this, you know, Facebook is like a country of its own, you know, it has its laws and it has its own economy and you, you, you play into that. So it's not just enough, I think, to say you have to evolve other spaces to do your activism. I think it's also about raising awareness on what's problematic about these platforms and, you know, what you're exchanging. Um, for this idea of voice or, or expression or mobilization. So mm. I'll, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. That was uh, very insightful. And I think, as Gillian also raised in her opening keynote, that topic of censorship is, you know, that's a complex issue that we look at all from our own cultural and national political contexts. And as was mentioned on the last panel, of course, we in Germany also have a very specific history and certain content that's not allowed online specifically uh, Nazi content that's forbidden. Uh, so that's a kind of censorship too, but one that the general public is in agreement with um, for, for my person, like, specific history. Um, however, there are, of course, uh, even though we are living in a, in a pretty luxurious situation, as we've all noticed uh, over the past days, at least getting to know each other and exchanging experiences and thoughts, there are, of course, always also attempts in the German government to sort of infringe on civil online digital rights and the discussion um, on um, pornography online. We had a similar discussion here in Germany on preventing um, child pornography online, how to get around that, um, where we um, were able to stop a law being passed that would have introduced censorship on a whole new level in Germany from a good cause. Now, a lot of the times, whenever there is these kind of actions coming from the German government, part of the lobbying is also to explain that, look, if you do this, you open the door to other countries in the world doing this on a much larger scale or for many different reasons, maybe. So with that, Christian, I'd like to ask the question to you, having heard this, uh, maybe as, an, as a starting question to you, how do you see Germany's and Europe's responsibility and role when it comes to protecting digital rights online on, on a global level? Well, it actually has the same responsibility as with other human rights, and I think digital rights is, di having digital rights is talking about human rights, and I think um, looking at the policy of digital rights is um, dealing with the contradictions you deal with with the whole German human rights policy and the Western human rights policy. Um, to, to make it concrete, I think Germany, on the one hand, has a human rights commissioner in the government, and we understand ourselves as a country which is exporting, fighting for human rights. Uh, and in some countries, it's very easy to um, fight for um, such human rights and for, for digital rights as well. To give one example, Belarus is one example where Germany no, has no real interests, and there it's very easy to to fight for human rights and even to um, to claim from time to time that digital rights is something very important. Yesterday, I was in a discussion. I was moderating a discussion about Uzbekistan, and Uzbekistan. I think I mentioned this example because it's the same region in Europe, well, Central Asia, if you include it to 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 Europe a bit, um, and Uzbekistan. It's totally different when you talk about human rights and talk about responsibility of Germany because in Uzbekistan you already see that it's much, much more difficult to talk about, frankly, um, about human rights and this means digital rights as well. To make it a um, bit more concrete, what Germany, what we as reporters are bought as a very journalistic organization, what we 
criticize is um, in the field of digital rights at Germany, on the one hand, is exporting um, surveillance technology to, to lots of dictatorships and, and um, authoritarian countries, and not only exporting it actively, and, um, but it's promoting it um, with um, export guarantees, and I think that's a very um, scandalous topic, not only Germany, we know it from the UK as well, but we, you asked me about Germany. And and on the other hand, uh, yeah, we have a um, human rights policy policy criticizing this, and I think that's a big contradiction of German policy and what we, as a journalistic organization, defending journalists and assisting journalists in situations of need, criticize as the export into those countries, criticize that there is no transparency in, in those export guarantees. And you've recently launched a campaign, and I think I have targeted the OECD with a complaint on this. Yeah, actually, we we targeted two um, two companies. It's Trovicor, which is a German company, and a British German company, Gamma. And I think when we talk about how to organize activism, I think it's interesting because we we organize it on a transnational level with other NGOs, with Privacy International, which probably some of you know, the European Center for Constitutional Human Rights, Bahrain Watch, and uh, Bahrain Center for Human Rights. And we we targeted two those two companies in the UK and in Germany. Um, Asking them, asking them, um, how do you um, guarantee that you did a human rights risk assessment exporting those technologies? Um, in fact, this instrument of an OCD complaint is not that sharp as the media um, described it after we introduced the OCD complaint. But from a PR perspective, we were very happy about this. But but the problem is um, that the whole technology, the surveillance technology, is yeah, is a so-called do you use technology? And I don't think that I have to explain it here with this audience. This is a problem and the challenge of the do you use technology. Um, but uh, we are really looking forward at least now to, to receive more information within the process of the OECD complaint. But the OECD complaint is, is the instrument we choose because right now we weren't able to risk really uh, a formal um, judicial complaint in, in front of any court. Probably this could be another consequence when we know more after the OECD complaint and after after we will have talked to those companies and probably then we will go to court. But right now it's more an investigation instrument against those two companies. And at least both companies reacted for the first time publicly and we um, will see how it goes on. Excellent. And maybe that's a call for everybody to watch out what's happening on that front and uh, and support what you're doing there. I'd like to open the floor for questions and also for each other to react to what, what these uh, opening statements have contained. So, uh, Jeremy, you wanted to add something to what Christian just said? I wanted to add a quick something. Uh, I'm now much more relaxed uh, as I, I see. I, I was the only one to, to try to stick to what was supposed to be the content of this discussion. So now no, it's, it's fine. It's fine because actually I refrained myself from speaking about policy the, the whole time. Um, I understood also why I wasn't comfortable with the title is that repression, censorship and surveillance sounds a bit like life, the universe and everything, you know, <laughs> there's too much in it. So an answer would be 42, obviously, but that's that's not enough. Um, but uh, once again, if we, we try to, to, to make connections between, between this, knowing that what we've just heard, that uh, the, the, the cultural differences, but when I say cultural, it's also difference in the, 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 the political culture of different areas, changes every situation, every risk assessment, every uh, uh, very notion of, of security or repression that you have to consider. But what, what is common? in repression, censorship, and surveillance, is that it's usually abuses by uh, hyper-centralized and vertical uh, forms of power. Whether it's Facebook, Google, the US government, Jordan government, the Indian government, or the EU commission, you have those hyper-verticalized structures that abuse their power. And so if there was one common pattern into fighting those, 
would be uh, breaking those abuse, breaking this verticality, taking back the power that has been vertically stolen from us through the use of those horizontal, multi-dimensional technologies uh, that allow us for, for interconnection. And so it's about taking back power. It's about claiming back power over those centralized actors. And it's about uh, taking risks. And it's about being courageous. And it reminds me of the courage is contagious motto of WikiLeaks that is still as of today an example for all of us of individuals taking the small bit of free internet they have between their, their hands and showing the world what the power of information is and how worth it is to, to spread it, to share it, and to share collectively the, the, the knowledge about those abuses, about this concentration of power. And so it is about exposure and it is about courage and it is about uh, maybe reaching a critical mass in doing it, because as it was said, if a small portion of uh, a rich middle class, um, if just some people do it, then it will fail. So we have to get critical mass, which means, and this has been said also, that we have to find uh, new ways of doing it. We have to constantly reinvent ourselves in doing it. And it has to be fun. It has to come uh, from the, the feelings. It has to come from the hearts. You have to use cats in doing it. Yes, you must always use cats. Thank you. Quick response, Christian? Yeah, I, would like just, I would like just to add one short point um, to, to what you said, Maya, um, um, regarding the awareness and for, from, from a journalistic perspective. I think that's a crucial point in Germany and internationally as well, because of course there is a governmental responsibility for, 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 for exporting for, for, for securing such, such technology through 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 export guarantees, and of course there's a res company's responsibility for producing and exporting itself. But what I would like to say is that there is a, of course a responsibility of the activists and the journalists as well for for being aware about those technologies and the, for being aware about um, about bypassing such, uh, such technologies. And I think that's really a problem that lots of journalists and even activists are not really aware of technologies, how to bypass censorship, um, if there are some technologies you can bypass. Quick response, Maya? Well, I, I think just what, what Christian said, that I think there is a lack of engagement with what technology is, definitely in the Indian context. By, by contrast, um, the Pakistanis that I know, your average Pakistani activist, non-activist with an internet connection is uh, are using circumvention technologies much more just because of what the context is there. Um, I don't want to be on a panel kind of, you know, saying too many bad things about my country. Um, however, um, I think that, um, uh, I think that there is there's a moment in my country where we are we have become this fat expanded middle class that suddenly moved from this mixed socialist economy to oh my god the free market we can buy things we can shop and I feel that there is there is kind of an apathy within this community that even uh, has the ability to speak out so to what Jeremy is saying about about courage and about engagement, I think one of the issues that we grapple with is that when you've always seen the government and the law and centralized institutions and mechanisms as being where change happens, um, and I mean, yes, there was an independence movement that happened that started in 1857 and ended in 1947, um, but at the same time, it's always been very centralized, that change. So one of the big um, things that happened recently was um, many of you must have heard about this really horrific case of gang rape in Delhi, which sort of really galvanized a lot of people around the country, and, and especially in Delhi in December. Uh, what's interesting about that is I think it has kind of made people more and more people aware of what's happening online and what you can do offline and the role of law and policy in that. Um, there are, yes, there are certain things that need to be addressed within the law, but there's a much greater conversation now. Uh, the way I like to say it, it's like they're talking about rape in their living rooms, that all kinds of everyday people are suddenly having to articulate this. It's on television, it's, on, it's everywhere. So I think that you have these flashpoint moments where things 
sort of start changing at, uh, or there's a new conversation that's happening at one level, but there's this idea still that we must change the law on rape. Yes, we must, but there are also lots of other ways to think about how we can respond, and sometimes I feel that's not, you know, happening enough. Um, and Reem, you wanted to also uh, respond very quickly. Yes. Um, just wanted to talk about uh, the credibility of governments when they, um, when, when we're asking the German government, for example, to uh, um, do something which I don't know what yet regarding the exports of, sur of surveillance uh, softwares. It's really important uh, if 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 you want to be a credible as a government to to actually expose the kind of censorship that you're doing in your own country. This is one thing, and then the second is uh, to to stop talking about uh, democratic and digital rights, um, uh, addressing people uh, in, in countries that do not have these rights, while you're also practicing the same rights in your uh, in your uh, country as well, or, or going against these rights in your country. So it's it's very important for us to be uh, standing on the same level when we're talking about surveillance and not addressing it in a way that uh, some countries are doing it while other countries are not. And this is how you want to gain some credibility in the eyes of the people and uh, I just wanted to say that it's when it comes to censorship I think our uh, maybe biggest enemy is not more not not surveillance more than self-censorship or because um, in, in for example 2009 um, there was uh, a big survey mass survey um, uh, about journal for journalists and 90% of them were saying that they were practicing in Jordan 90% of them they said that they were practicing self censorship and uh, for us passing a law like that um, means that you're soul defying this kind of uh, environment of fear um, while it's it's already existed i don't want to, to i mean jordan is not the worst when it comes to, in, in terms of um, real-time practices and translating that on the ground when it comes to censorship and surveillance. But at the same time, there is self-censorship that is preventing any kind of movements to, to happen as well. Thank you. That's a very good point, and I think that affects a lot of people in, in many places. Matt, thank you so much for being so patient. You have the mic. Okay, Matt Musla from Palestine. First, I'd like to thank Jeremy, because he me makes me feel good that I'm not the only one with no Facebook. <laughs> Second, uh, <laughs> some of the method that you spoke about is method that we use in, in, in the end-to-end -end, uh, encryption, where you know we, we use expressions and words where only a group of us know what's it, and which is difficult. Uh, and we, when we need to discuss something thoroughly, we go to the street or a safe house to do that, uh, which is uh, good. But uh, I have. I, I want to just ask about the surveillance and security. I, I have two questions mainly. First, uh, don't you think that our obsession with internet security have uh, ended up in uh, in sort of uh, uh, and you know I, I playing against the freedom of speech? I mean, we're going for freedom of speech, but the point of freedom of speech is not just saying what you want to say; it's just having people hear it. And people who have, uh, who are who are obsessed with uh, uh, internet security, like Reem said, they practice self-censorship. They don't speak it out because of uh, internet security. And the second thing is on surveillance and uh, uh, internet security. Uh, what I mean, yes, I understand. In some countries, uh, there is a need, or people can work on changing the laws or policies that are there that. Uh, uh, enforces surveillance on people, but in some countries, that's really not the case, or that's really difficult, especially when you're fighting an, a foreign, a sort of foreign occupation, where in our case, we are under surveillance from the Israeli occupation, which we can't go tell them, oh, well, you, you, you can't, uh, you know, uh, watch out of, you know, look at what uh, our private conversation on the internet and all that. So what's the way around that, uh, around that, you know, to, guarantee a sort of secure line for um, for our work. Um, Thank you. Jeremy, you can respond. Please give me a sign of hand. We have time for about two, three more interventions. If you want to say something, please, you first. But you can respond first. Um, uh, okay, briefly, you, you're, you're right. You'll see many security experts actually doing nothing else but security, which is 
paradoxical. Um, I had this analogy once that uh, security is like a wall. If you don't want children to go up, you build a one meter fifty wall. If you want adults not to be able to climb it, you make a three meters wall. If you want uh, starving adults not to climb it, you make a five meters wall with barbed wire. But in all cases, people can go over it, through it, under it. It's a matter of uh, what I call the risk assessment. And uh, of course, you have to, to, to make a trade-off and not, not think about it all the time. And this is why it is so crucial that you base this not on technology, but on uh, concepts. So you can check the implementation of those concepts a long time. You can make it vary. But as long as you're, you're clear with, with the concepts, then you, you won't have a bad surprise. In, in the case of uh, using Facebook or not using Facebook, the, the point is this privatized censorship can strike anytime, and you don't see it coming. So if you publish stuff on your website, then maybe you can consider it's fine to republish it on Facebook, like we republish on Twitter what we published already. So if one day Facebook or Twitter censors it, well, it's still on the primary source. You're, you're still still there. And so with security, it's very uh, a complex uh, risk assessment and um, uh, thought process to have. Because you know people learn how to do backups after they lost their data. You learn the value of personal, make backups, please. <laughs> um, you, you, you learn about the value of your personal data after there has been a data breach. So it's, it's always this, you have to, to anticipate, you have to make some kind of, um, it's like a mortgage on your, on your data, on your life and your security, but you, you're right, your objectives must come first, as long as you're clear with your ethics, as long as the values of your ethics are in line with the technology you're using, like decentralized services, free software, end-to-end -end encryption, then yeah, please do care about your issue first. Christian, one sentence to add? Yeah. One sentence was a comma, probably. Oh, no. um, um, just very briefly, just to say, I'm not a techie, and from a non-techie perspective, I would not say that we are obsessed with the surveillance questions. From our experience at the uh, Reporters Without Borders, where we help in our assistance work on a day-to-day -day level, journalists that have been threatened and that have been surveyed with such technology that have been tortured, I think that's not a kind of obsession of all the surveillance questions, and I really say this from a non-techie perspective. And I just want to make this point. Thanks. Sheena. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, Sheena from um, Namibia. And um, this is also very interesting for me. Um, looking at the Namibian context, first and foremost, internet access is a luxury. A lo lot of people don't have access to the internet. And the few people that do don't care. So people who do use the internet for activism have to use it in a very creative way because a lot of the times the information you want to share is not going to be easily accessed by the people. And therefore, I'd say the government doesn't really try um, to regulate it, uh, or so we thought, until this one day this crazy person in a very, literally a hick town somewhere starts posting um, the HIV statuses of people on Facebook. Oh. And so this goes public and then he's arrested and he's prosecuted. I think he was, um, the, the, the charges were laid were very mundane. He was fined and then he was free to go. But then what this then does, even before activists can use the internet as a tool for activism and lobbyism, the, the government, which again doesn't understand, are like, okay, so we're going to um, table a bill that says um, um, you need to have certain permits to even use the internet. You need to have certain this. They, they create all these ridiculous processes that make it hard for people to access that kind of information. And this is just something I thought I would share that in very many parts where activists really need to use this, it is a luxury. And we have to find possibly other ways. Cell phones are what many people then use instead, where you have like mass SMSs that are sent throughout. Uh, but also controlling that. There's all, it's, a, it's a small population. Um, there's a lot of oligarchy. So every people will charge you whatever the heck they want for you to use their, their technology in that sense. So technology and its use and its access and its availability is very limiting for so very many people, especially in Namibia. Thank you very much for sharing that example, Sheena. Um, Maya, you'd like to react to that? Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, echo what uh, Sheena said and understand that, I mean, that's that's something that's brought up constantly and it, I feel it has actually fragmented some activist movements in many parts of the world. I, I've 
been working within the women's rights movement for many years and one of the things that keeps being brought up is oh there are so many poor people and poor women who do not have access to technologies and you know technology is something that um, actually distances and separates people much further and reinforces the divides that exist and so you spend a lot of time in some movements having to um, actually make a case for you know different kinds of technologies and then you know my, my argument is always to say okay let's define what a technology is you know the spinning wheel is a technology <laughs> um, so I think that 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 becomes there has to be a way to I think go around that argument um, and that and in the case of India, coming back to something you mentioned, but I didn't say, is that there's this awkward situation where IT is supposed to contribute to some, you know, fantastic amount of the GDP, like eight or ten percent or something. Um, however, there's, you know, this, that's never seen in context. The, the business implications of something like that are never seen in context of all the other things that, you know, technology sort of afford and provide. So um, I think that that's that's another one of those uh, meta questions that kind of really gets addressed in a number of different fora. Just run out of time, but I'd like to give the last question or intervention from the floor to Fukami. Yeah, um, well, uh, what, what, what I found interested, uh, uh, interesting in, in uh, India and, and uh, other Indian and, and the uh, Jordan view was that uh, it sounds pretty much like we discussed since the 90s. Means the governments take all the same like arguments for for blocking and for for, for stuff means like uh, pornography, terrorism, and stuff like that. Yeah? So uh, what we observe in the moment is like uh, if the people from China or from like Russia, yeah, and you start uh, saying, "Oh, you are you are blocking the internet." They, they just laugh at us and say, you do as well. And I mean, the, the, the main problem we have is that it is, uh, that, um, that it's hard to, 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 to get people to understand what the issue is, especially if they start to, to uh, use it like in, in, the, in, the, in the Western countries, like using, using um, intellectual property, for example, to, 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 to block things and stuff. And um, if those technologies in effect, and we see that in China, you have no, you 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 have, uh, you have actually no possibility anymore to to really circumvent uh, uh, and censorship. So uh, I think we already lost the war. Yeah, I think so. We don't disagree, but we we just win little little fights like like ACTA and stuff like that, which is uh, uh, um, great. But we we are losing the war because we are not able to to defend it really. You know, we are the, the 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 governments are too strong, and so those those policy makers uh, sometimes don't understand what they are doing. But uh, I'm 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 pretty sure that that uh, that we won't get around it. Maybe I'll take that as a we won't have a full round of closing statements because we've run out of time. But maybe for the first person to grab the mic, are we losing the war? <laughs> Go. <laughs> I'm, s I'm s sorry to, to the other, and I'll try to make it less than 12 words. Uh, it is a political fight of global scope and global importance, and the, the, the future of our societies and our democracies is tied to those questions. But n no, we, we haven't lost the war yet. As long as we have a tool that enables us to globally share knowledge, and that we share knowledge about the technology and their implication on society, as long as we have a tiny bit of free internet between our hands, you cannot claim that this is lost. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I want to answer in the context of the conversations that we always have in terms of the media law has been passed. So what do we do now? Do we just uh, sit or was just our fight against uh, uh, the media law useless? And we thought that no, it, it, it actually costed the Jordanian government a lot and it's, it, it passed the media law upon a high price. It, was, it did not like pass it because uh, on, uh, while uh, no, med no international media attention was taking place, we were trying to think how can we embarrass the government? We know it's gonna get passed, but how can we embarrass the government on a, local, on a global level too? So we started uh, walking around with a grave that has uh, 
freedom of the internet around town and and this grabbed the media attention which actually for us was ki some kind of success because it passed the law upon a certain cost and this is what we're going to do when it comes to uh, censorship as well the porn censorship i think just reaching that point of despair where you think uh, you should just sit and uh, not fight although you know that the results is is very dangerous Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask you to give a big round of applause to my fantastic four panelists. Thank you, Reem. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Maya. So with that, um, we've kind of we've reached the, the end of the first half of our program. We're ready for lunch. But Christian, please do tell us. We have a lot of fantastic stuff coming up. That's right. That's right. It, we're going to meet here again at 2.30 for our panel and keynote on freedom of press. We move on with uh, feminist alliances and finally we come to generations of activists, all this one after each other. And Irina Bondas is gonna come, but in the second half. And now we have served for all of you great food down in the cafeteria, sponsored by Knofi in Kreuzberg. Some of you might know this. So either you all, you all eat it or nobody. <laughs> and I suggest everybody. Please be back okay. here sharp at 2.30 and catch all the highlights that we've prepared for you in the afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Bye.